a 15 minutes of this, then we'll roll into the open meeting law and, and uh, uh, public records and conflicts. And so if you're in the room and you have a question, just raise your hand and we'll, we'll address it as we go. And if you're on the Zoom, then you literally, I guess you raise your hand as well and we'll take the questions um, as we go, or do you, are they typing in the, the question? Are they, are they? They should type it okay. in, yeah. So if you have questions on Zoom, go ahead and type in the question and then we'll try and address it as we go so it's kind of timely. Okay, so what are today's objectives on workplace harassment? Bottom line is, is we're trying to prevent uh, harassment in the workplace. We're trying to prevent um, the city from being liable for harassment. Um, you know, and we're going to try and give you a basic understanding of what workplace harassment is and looks like. Uh, anybody who's been in the workforce in the last probably 30, 40 years has probably had this training multiple times. So it's definitely a refresher for everybody. Okay. Uh, and then we're going to talk about sort of responsibilities too. All right, so what's our policy? Prescott's policy, Pres Prescott has in its HR policy, which does apply to board and commission members, um, two portions of that talk about workplace harassment, sexual harassment and anti-discrimination. So those are, those are um, you know, two internal rules or city imposed rules that apply, that do apply to, again, employees, boards and commission members and, 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 and even council members. Um, the whole point of the policy uh, is to make sure that people are sort of mutually respectful and that we can all work together in a, in a pleasant environment. <clears throat> so we also are uh, governed by state and federal law. Um, state and federal law talk about employment discrimination. So sexual harassment is a form of workplace uh, of, of discrimination. Um, it's based in, in sexual harassment is, is discrimination generally based on sex or sexual identity or sexual orientation. Um, so it is a form of discrimination which can impose liability on the city on, and on you as an employee or as a board member um, if, you, if you commit a workplace harassment situation. Um, so what we're trying to do is we're trying to avoid uh, enduring uh, for an employee who um, has to endure bad conduct or bad behavior as a condition of staying employed or which generally is, is what's called pervasive, and I'll get to that. Things that happen many times over a period of time. Or conduct that's severe, severe uh, essentially could happen one time, but something that's so egregious that, that in and of itself amounts to some sort, some sort of harassment or discrimination, um, like, a, like an assault you know, at, at work. One severe incident can be um, a discriminatory act in and of itself. So we have Title VII, which is which is a Civil Rights Act that, that protects employees from discrimination based on protected classes, and we'll get into that. So again, single, severe or pervasive. Pervasive means it doesn't have to be necessarily severe, but it happens a lot. Uh, the same thing happens over and over again. You know, um, asking someone out on a date, and that person says no, and it just keeps asking, 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 asking. Um, use, you know, telling crude jokes. One, one offhand, one off color joke probably isn't uh, sexual harassment or workplace discrimination, but if it happens again and again and again and again, it could be. And again, and severe means it it's could be a single incident that's bad enough to amount to a harassment. So these are the things that are in the city policy. And by the way, our city policy is probably more restrictive than, than, than federal or state law. Um, so we're, in other words, we're sort of proactive on this to, pre to prevent and prohibit and respond to discrimination and, uh, and, and workplace harassment. Um, and, it's, and like I said, we do it for a couple of reasons. One is we want our, we want people to be able to work together, have a nice, pleasant work environment, you know, and be able to achieve, and, and we'll talk about this later, you know, achieve, we, we all work for the public. We're all doing the public's bidding. And so we want to be able to do that in a way without interference. And, and harassment and discrimination can affect people's performance. We also do it to prevent liability on the city, uh, you know, it, and to prevent bad public relations, bad PR, if, um, because inevitably discrimination type claims, harassment type claims, if they go public, or, or sorry, if, they, if we get a, a lawsuit of some sort, inevitably it's gonna be reported in the paper. And, it's just, and it becomes, you know, 
it becomes a distraction to a lot because it takes, and I don't mean that in a, in a, a to minimize the way, it's distracted because it takes a lot of staff effort and personnel effort to then deal with it, which takes away from our collective um, obligation to do the public's business and to, and to, you know, to move Prescott forward on things. So all of these things you see on the slide can, can, can be harassment. Again, um, jokes and slurs and name calling, um, you know, depending on how, how severe they are, most of that is what falls in that pervasive category. It has to happen many times uh, or frequently or over a certain amount of time. It has to happen often. Things like a physical assault or an intimidation could be, per, could be so severe that one instance could amount to uh, harassment or, um, or a hostile work environment. Oh, there's another one. All right. So, like I said, our policy is broader than the law. We, we actually go a little bit beyond what the, what the law requires us to do. So, in other words, um, sexual harassment law, so this, you know, a joke here and there um, isn't sexual harassment necessarily, but the city policy, a single joke could result in employee discipline. Um, and as a board and commission member, it could result in removal from your board position or your commission. Um, uh, your, your commission position. And so we, we, you know, like I said, we sort of prohibit certain acts that may not necessarily as a matter of law constitute sexual harassment or discrimination. But again, the, the point of it all is, is to make sure that there's a good working environment that people can re remain productive. Okay, so who could harass? Um, basically anybody. And when we talk about elected officials, or volunteers, that's you all. I mean, you're, a, you're, a, you're volunteers, essentially, you're, you're as a board commission member. So you can be, you know, you can be deemed and harassed. So that's why we're, we're, uh, we're doing this training. You can be deemed a harasser, a harasser, and harasser, um, you know, if, 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 by your behavior. Okay. So harassment just as in sexual harassment, harassment can be based on race, uh, religion, national origin, age, um, disability, or in, in relatively new to the scene is gender identity or sexual orientation. That's probably in the last, I want to say year, and that's been added by the EEOC as a as sort of a protected class or a class that, that if um, someone's discriminated against based on that, that can result in an EEOC claim or a lawsuit. Um, so, you know, for instance, age is one, um, you know, if you're over 40 or you're a member of the protected class and, um, you know, it, it, again, there's a lot of maybe joking going on, hey, old man, or hey, when are you going to retire? At some point, that could result in, in a discrimination type claim, although those cupcakes with the RIP little thing looks pretty, pretty good. So, um, or disability, um, those kinds of things. And obviously, we've seen in the news today, there's a lot of um, a lot of discussion on race and uh, national origin and even religion. Um, so what we try and basically do is, you know, it's kind of like, you know, what, what are those things you don't talk about at dinner? Sex, religion, politics. We don't talk about that at work. We try not to talk about it at work too much to avoid just to avoid conflicts um, with other coworkers. So everybody is familiar with Me Too movement. There are close to, I think, 300 sort of famous people, uh, celebrity type people that lost their jobs based on essentially sexual harassment claims. Some way more egregious than others. Um, some, some have resulted in criminal charges. Harvey Weinstein, for instance, is, is, you know, he's been charged with, with, with criminal charges. It still is a sexual harassment type activity, but, it's, but it can fall into a criminal act. Others, um, you know, Matt Lauer, for instance, um, haven't didn't, didn't cross the line into a criminal act, but certainly um, lost a you know, obviously lucrative position um, because of his history of, of you know sexual harassment type activities. Um, and again, as a board and commission member, um, it could affect you in the sense of you could be asked to resign or or remove from your board or commission position. Um, if, if an allegation is sustained um, on a, a sexual harassment type claim or discrimination type claim. So these are the forms of sexual harassment, um, unwelcome sexual advances, requests for sexual favors, 
Um, they have, it has to affect the person's employment or unreasonably interfere with their employment. So, and, and again, a single, a single event could, depending on you know, the, how severe it is, could result in a sexual harassment type claim. Um, if, you know, if, you're, if you're making fun of people, or not making fun of people, if you're making fun with people, if you're joking around, um, it may or may not be sexual harassment. I think the best advice that I give to people is know your audience. If you're gonna joke about things, you're gonna talk about things, particularly things that some people might find offensive or some people might, you know, might take too seriously, you know, know, know your audience. And so make sure that you're comfortable with your audience. And so, you know, you can push the envelope with certain people and with other people, you know, you can be much more um, kind of vanilla and not, and, not have, and not sort of push the envelope. So just make sure you know your audience. And if you don't know your audience, just pretend they're your grandma or your mom and just behave. And uh, that's the best way to handle it. So there's two types of sexual harassment. There's quid pro quo. Uh, which is this for that. Basically, it's usually supervisor subordinate type situation. And, and generally speaking, a sexual a quid pro quo is some type of sexual um, favor in return for some type of benefit, including, you know, if you want to keep your job, you have to do this or do that. So, um, and effectively, it's, it's a use, use of power in, as a supervisor um, against a subordinate employee. Hostile work environment, which is way more common, uh, believe it or not, nowadays, is essentially um, like, a, a, again, it's more pervasive type um, activities that just happen again and again and again and again. Um, and so what we tell our employees, and we'll get to this, is you know, if this is going on, you need to inform someone, a supervisor, HR, legal, and our obligation at that point is to look into it, is to investigate it, to see if it in fact is a uh, hostile work environment type situation. Um, you can, in theory, use social media um, to, to commit a sexual harassment type violation. Um, it all just depends on how, how much that social media use that Facebook or whatever you're using kind of um, injects itself into your work environment. So. Um, if you have a bunch of your coworkers on your Facebook page and you start doing things, um, especially if you're calling certain people out, that may be considered offensive behavior. That, you know, you, what you do as an employee, uh, and, and to some degree as a board or commission member, what you do in your private life can impact, you know, your employment um, if, it's, if it's bad enough behavior. So we all know that it's easy to sit behind a keyboard and be a tough guy. So uh, that, and that kind of tends for people to sort of um, act badly because they aren't, they aren't with people in person. So the other thing that gets us in trouble at the city, or as an employer, I should say, um, is retaliation. And that is someone files a complaint of discrimination or harassment or hostile work environment, and then they're treated differently or badly or, or less positively once they file the complaint. I'll give you an example. There was a sexual harassment complaint, City of Phoenix, by a female police officer. Um, she claimed that her supervisors were discriminating against her and treating her differently because she was female and she became pregnant. Uh, and they went through a whole investigation. EEO looked at it and said, no sexual harassment, no hostile work environment. The, 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 the allegations are not sustained. And then guess what happens at the City of Phoenix Police Department? They demote her, they move her to a different shift, they, they give her, you know, they move her from day to night, um, they give her a, you know, a 12 year old squad car instead of the Tahoe she was driving. They do all this stuff to her. So then, so then what happens, she files a retaliation claim and she wins. So even when you sort of win the first battle, you can lose the war by being stupid uh, or doing dumb things. So that's, and that's what happens. So we obviously try and do, avoid doing that. Um, you know, so we don't, we, you know, we don't, uh, we, we, we even, because I can tell you, we've, we've seen a lot of hostile work environment complaints in my almost eight years here. And, I would, and the vast majority aren't sustained. Doesn't mean they're false. Doesn't mean the person was lying. It just means that when we do a thorough investigation, 
the facts don't support a conclusion of hostile work environment. Uh, and so, and then, but that employee is still around. And so what happens then is you, you make sure that you don't, you don't retaliate against that employee because that employee does have a right to file a, a legitimate complaint just because it's not sustained doesn't mean it's false. And there's, there's a big difference between that. If it were a false complaint, um, and we see that a lot too, where an employee is going to get disciplined and they know it, the day before they get their letter of reprimand, they file a sexual harassment or a, some sort of discrimination complaint. That happens a lot. Um, we still have to investigate it, but if it's determined that, that it's, not, it's a false allegation, we can take disciplinary action against that person at that point in time. So what to avoid, these, are, these, are, these, these quotes here are literally quotes that we've gotten from employees and other people who were accused of discrimination or hostile work environment. Uh, she's my friend, you know, I hugged her. And even though the, the, the male employee, you know, was very physical with the female employee, the female employee didn't like it um, and told him, no, don't. And he kept, he consistent, he, he, he did it. Um, you know, these, so, so these are things that people use, as, I guess, as an explanation or an excuse of their behavior. But um, again, this is kind of a good example of not knowing your audience. If you go watch a movie on Netflix or whatever, and you see some, some scene and you want to describe it to your coworkers or, your, or, or employees, make sure you know that your employees are willing to hear your story and uh, don't just do it for sort of shock value. So um, Prescott be, does, is, as an employer, Prescott can become liable for your behavior as a board commission member if, if it amounts to sexual harassment or some form of discrimination. Um, as particularly if we don't take it seriously. So um, I, I suspect that nobody in here is going to be the subject of an investigation, um, but we do take it seriously when there is an investigation, because if we don't, then we have almost automatic liability. Um, so what happens uh, when there is harassment and there's actual harassment, it affects the employee's uh, performance. They don't perform like they're supposed to perform, and they're working for the, the you know the residents Prescott. They're working for the taxpayers. They're here to do the public's business, and so in a in a hostile environment, they just don't do the job that they're paid to do. So it really kind of in effect that the, the effect is it's it's taking away from the the benefits of the taxpayers and the residents here. Uh, what happens to the person who is the harasser? You lose your job. You can get reprimanded, you can get demoted. As a board of commission member, like I said, you could be, you can be removed from, from, the, uh, from, the, from the position, um, you know, and, and it could be a public removal. If, if, the, if, the, if a board of commission member is asked to leave and they refuse, that person refuses to, the council actually has to take action, like at a public meeting to vote, to remove the person. And then of course, you know, City Bark sitting in the corner there is going to be like, oh, I'm writing this up. This is a good story. So <laughs> that happens, you know. And then there's also individual civil or criminal liability that you may that a, a harasser may face. So what we tell our employees: if you're harassed, tell somebody, uh, report it, so we can look into it. Um, we're not going to keep it confidential. You know, we we don't have that option or opportunity. But at the same time. Um, you're, you know, that person, and I hate to use the term, but the person is sort of the victim or the subject of the, of the harassment. So we, we, we try to tell our employees, you know, tell us and we'll look into it uh, and we won't retaliate against you as, as, the, as the accuser. Um, and and uh, the other thing we tell our employees is don't assume people know about this because oftentimes we don't. We, management, legal, HR, we don't know what's going on necessarily in wherever you're working in some corner of the building. So if, if for whatever reason, one of your, you know, as a board commission member, if an employee comes to you, um, this is sort of what we tell our supervisors or, or, or employees. If an employee comes to you and says, you know, so and so, I think I'm being harassed or I have a hostile work environment, don't, don't not do anything. You know, go ahead and talk to your, um, if, if it's your staff liaison, talk to that person's department head and then that person the department head can then handle it from there you could get basic information but uh, for the most part if you just turn it over to, to a department head or another supervisor then they'll carry the ball for you and you know, and then at that point you may be a you may be called to to give a statement of some sort as a witness you know what you heard what the, what the person the accuser told you um, but the, but you'll kind of be out of it at that point in time 
So bottom line, Raleigh, is, is you know, you, you are representatives of the city as, as board commission members. And so we, we want our, you know, we, we want our city, not only our employees, but our public officials that you are to represent the city well. And so we don't want is for uh, our, our public officials to act in ways that, that make the city look bad or embarrass the city, um, the, the city government or the city as a whole. Okay, so any questions on that harassment, hostile work environment, anything like that? Yes, sir. How long have you been doing this, John? <laughs> How long doing what? This. It's been about 20 minutes. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, been a lawyer since 1983. No, but I mean the, the, uh, this session we have every year. For oh, the city. Uh, I've been here almost eight years, so eight years. At least, at least, and probably do more than one. You know, I do them um, two or three times, so a year. You know, yesterday we did two sessions, today we did one, so 25 and 50 times in in and, just since I've been here. And have there been examples of harassment here? Yeah, really. Yeah, yeah. yeah we've had two examples of two. Just from boards and commission members, who who committed a hostile work environment, sexual harassment type issue against against employees, completely separate and unrelated, uh, and both of those um, commission members were were asked to resign, and they both did. So, um, but at the same time, we probably have, in terms of complaints, um, and a lot of times, the, you know, coming the complaints by subordinates against supervisors um, if you know we, we've had a lot of its age discrimination or a lot of its hostile work environment uh, my boss is me my boss is give me the assignments I want um, you know and, and we kind of you know part of my language but being an asshole isn't against the law you know a, a, a boss and a supervisor can be you know can be kind of a jerk but as long as it's not doesn't fall within those categories it, it, there's nothing illegal about it. At the same time, we try and then train that supervisor about good management practices, good leadership skills um, in terms of, because when you're in a supervisor position, you have a leadership obligation to those people. So we, we train people, we give people the good training, I think. But yeah, so we've had, we've had like I said, in my, in my tenure here, two board commission members who were removed. So that's why we do this um, for you all, just so you, you know, we kind of check the box a little bit uh, just to make sure you're aware of it and then if something because in both instances It was responsible. Nobody ever told me I couldn't do it And then you look back and well you went to the study you went to the training about eight months ago We told you exactly you couldn't do exactly what you did. So it, it's just it's kind of to protect us too um, But you know, and it doesn't hurt to have a refresher. So any other questions? Okay, want to switch over? Yeah, let's see if I can do that okay, We're gonna roll into open meeting law Training, conflicts of interest, and uh, public record. I'm going to spend most of my time on the open meeting law portion of this, um, and real quickly talk about public records and conflicts of interest, and get you out of here, hopefully in less less than an hour if I can. So you usually go about 90 minutes total. Okay, so this is your training. As I mentioned earlier, we do the public's work. We do the public's bidding, and we do it in public as a particularly when it comes to city council members or city councils, boards and commissions, your work is done in public. Um, probably 99% of the time. There are a couple of exceptions, but you do your work in public, you make your decisions in public, you have your debates in public, and you vote in public. You, so that the public has the right, has the ability to participate in that process. That's why we do it. Um, so I use this to Florida calls open meeting law, sunshine laws. And the reason they call it that because Sunshine is the best disinfectant. When it comes to government, sunshine disinfects government. That's kind of the theory behind it. Um, so when you have a, so this is about having a meeting or not having a meeting. Uh, that's what an open meeting law, open meeting law is intended to deal with. So what's a meeting? It's a, it's a, it's a gathering of a quorum, a majority of your board or commission. So assume seven, I'm gonna probably use seven as the, as, as the example. There's sometimes there's five, sometimes there's more. Four, four members get together, talk business, talk commission or board business, you're having a meeting. So you, you can only do that when you're agendized to have that meeting and you can only at that meeting, agendized meeting, talk about the items that are agendized. So, yes. That's why at our planning commission, right. when Cisco came up, you had, you had right. four cancel. Yeah, so I'll, I'll you know, use that example in a minute. 
but you, you, can't, you can't discuss things, you can't propose, you can't deliberate and, and take legal action. It means you can't vote or agree to do something outside of a meeting and outside of the agenda of the meeting. So what happens if you show up and you don't have your four, your quorum, you don't have a meeting, you have to just cancel it and reschedule it for another time. Uh, we've had situations where boards of commissions, for some reason, you, the quorum doesn't show up, you wait for 10 minutes, wait for 15 minutes, uh, you know, and you know that uh, you're not gonna have a quorum. I've had, I've had uh, board members say, well, can we just sit around and talk about this? It's like, no, because even though you're not a quorum, the risk is you have three people talking about it, and if one of those three then goes to talk, goes and talks to a fourth person, you potentially are going to have a meeting. So we like to do things very formal, very conservatively when it comes to open meeting law, so we can avoid um, the appearance that that things are going on in the city behind closed doors or outside of public view. People in general have a healthy distrust of government. Um, in Prescott, it's very healthy. A very healthy distrust in our which is good. I mean, it keeps it's a checks and balance system, so that's why we like to make sure we do things on the level and and um, consistent with with the open meeting law. So, notice an agenda. The only thing you need to know that you, you are notice an agenda because your staff liaison is going to be handling creating of the agenda, posting the notices properly. Is that when you're at the meeting, you got to stick to the agenda. That's why we don't put things that are generic, like new business, old business. We have very specific topics that you have to stick to. The only, the, the, the leeway is, is if it's a study session, oftentimes it's a broader topic. Uh, let's say um, uh, you're going to talk about um, some public works, or let's say we're going to talk about, commit, committee's going to talk about water, water resources. And it's a study session. No vote's going to happen. It's just more inf informative. The, the agenda item can be City of Prescott water resources, you know, and, and, and use. And that's very broad. But if there were to be a vote on it, we'd have to make sure that the agenda was tightened up for that. Um, so you're, normally you'll have a staff person that will try and keep you on track and not let you or the public who may be at your meeting come and talk about things that may not be on the agenda. We try and squeeze that down. So people follow follow the agenda. What's the exception to the to the posting of the agenda um, today? Earlier today, at a planning commission meeting. Well, the question was, can we just can we just recess and then continue this meeting? So technically, yeah, you can. But that's usually um, when you have a meeting that let's say goes late into the night. When I was in Sedona, worked in Sedona years ago, they had a midnight rule because we started meetings at seven. And you couldn't start a new item after midnight. And I can't tell you how many times that rule came into play. So we go to 1230 on an item, but then if there were another one or two items left on the agenda, they couldn't start those. It was too late. So we have to start the next morning at 11 in the morning, let's say. You'd recess and then reconvene at 11, and you didn't have to post a 24-hour notice. It doesn't happen very often on here because most of our meetings are daytime meetings, and most don't go beyond a certain time. Uh, the other the other exception to the 24-hour rule is an actual emergency. Should be any board or commission emergencies. Usually, that would be if the city council needs to meet because there's a fire or a snowstorm or something um, where the council wants to meet and do something. You can you can you can avoid that 24-hour rule. But again, um, that, those are both things where you'll want to make sure your staff people are well versed in this and they'll probably pick up if we're not at the meeting they'll probably pick up the phone and uh and call us okay so who must comply all the boards of commissions we have have to comply with open meeting law uh the other thing you have to remember is that if you if your board decides hey let's form a subcommittee and so again we'll use the example of seven the subcommittee has to be fewer than the quorum it can't be four because in this in some meeting so you take three people form a subcommittee to study a topic and bring it back um, that subcommittee is also subject to open meeting law and has to make sure that it follows all the agenda rules too. Um, what can you do at the meeting? You can meet and take legal action, meaning you can vote, you can commit, you can agree um, if the agenda allows you to do that. We'll talk a little bit about exec sessions. For the most part, your boards and commissions shouldn't need to go into exec session. Um, those, and if you think you might need an exec session, 
then you, then your staff people should be contacting us beforehand to make sure that we're there to talk about that. Because the reason I say that is, is we go, we regularly attend planning commission and, and board of adjustment. And for the most part, because we have 27 or 28 uh, different boards and commissions, we just don't have enough lawyers to attend every single meeting. So um, what we would what we would normally do is talk to the staff people and say, if you need us, we'll be there, but only as needed. We can't, we just can't, we don't have enough time or enough people to, 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 to attend all these meetings. So if you think you might need an exec session, if you're a chair, if you're chairing a board um, and you think you might want to go into exec session for some reason, just make sure you talk to your staff liaison and they'll coordinate with us. The exception to the rule might be if you're on PSPRS board, for instance, and there's a medical retirement request. Well, you're going to look at medical documents, probably. Um, those things are things you want to talk about in the exec session. There's HIPAA and privacy issues. Um, so, so there are limited instances. The only other time um, you probably would, would need to go to exec session is just pure legal advice. Uh, maybe sometimes the Board of Adjustment needs it. Maybe sometimes Planning Commission needs it. But I can tell you that we give way more legal advice in public than any other lawyer in his right mind would do. Because we're sitting there literally, you know, at a meeting and, and some, a, a member, a council member or a board member will ask us for essentially what amounts to legal advice. You don't always have to go into exec session for legal advice. There are sometimes good reasons to, to go in and, and those things that we, we should discuss ahead of time if we, if we, if we can, if we can anticipate the need. Um, when there is an exec session, it's just the members of the body, the board, the lawyer, and whatever staff people are necessary to attend. It may only be one staff person, depending on what the topic is. Um, other than that, we try and keep a very close hold and not, have, not, not, allow, not allow a lot of people in. Um, just a reminder, if you ever do own an exec session, it's confidential, it's privileged, it's not to be discussed outside of the exec session. Um, you can't vote in exec session, but the most important thing is to remember is make sure you keep it confidential if for whatever reason you go into exec session. Um, the Attorney General addresses this. The Attorney General puts out a handbook on various things, including open meeting law. The Attorney General is going to be the enforcement agency if there's an open meeting law violation. And so if we follow what the Attorney General says in his handbook, we're usually pretty good. And the thing I want to point out is, is not only if you violate the confidentiality, not only are you violating open meeting law, you're subjecting yourself to criminal sanctions. So it's really kind of important to remember, don't talk about things that are done in confidence. Um, so what's legal advice? It's legal advice from your lawyer. We do not allow exec sessions without the approval of the city attorney's office in any of our boards and commissions. We're very strict on that because too often I've seen not here, but in other places, well, they'll go into exec session to talk about something that may be sensitive, embarrassing, um, not really something that they want to disclose to the public, but it has, there has to be a good reason for the exec session. It can't just be something that's a little sensitive or might hurt someone's feelings. Okay, so we talked about exec, now we're gonna go into what not to do, how to avoid violating open meeting law. So, and again, this is probably a refresher, don't call member, other members asking how they're going to vote. Um, don't discuss with other members uh, the topics that you're going to talk about at the meeting before the meeting. Um, don't email each other. It's the email is now the easiest way to violate open meeting law because, and I'll get into a little bit, because what you can't do in person, you can't do by email, you can't do by phone. It's all, the law treats it the same. Um, if you want to have distribute information, to your fellow board members, use your staff person. Hey, I want to share this information with the rest of the board before the meeting because I know it's on. It's 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 applicable to the topic we're going to talk about. That's fine. Um, what your staff person won't do, and don't ask them to do this, is to say, Hey, I want to share this information and tell the rest of the rest of the board we really need to vote yes on this item. Have you read this article? Please tell them that because if you can't tell them directly, your staff person. You can't use your staff person to, to do what you can't do. It's, it essentially becomes a open meeting law issue. Uh, and then, like I said before, if you, have, if you don't have a quorum, and, and it happens every once in a while, well, you'll have a quorum at the start, and then somebody all of a sudden has to leave, or the meeting goes longer, and then your quorum disappears, you gotta stop the meeting. You gotta end it right there. 
Okay, so again, we talked about polling, um, and we also talked about you know discussion among among less than a quorum and the risk. And here's how I describe it: If you have seven people and two two talk to each other about how they're going to vote or if they like something, if they don't like something, uh, I like it if they added this to their offer or this to their proposal, I would vote for it. And those two people talk. And then those two people go away and this one talks to one person and this one talks to another person. They've just had a meeting because now four people have talked about the same thing. So it doesn't have to be all at once. It, can, it doesn't have to be simultaneous. It could be sequential. And that, and so we, we advise everybody, just don't talk about things that are gonna come before your council or your board or your commission or they're likely to come before your board or commission um, until you're at the meeting. Save it for the meeting, do your business in public. Uh, and we talked about circumventing, you know, daisy chaining is one, one person talks to one, it's the old game of telephone, um, people used to play. Hub and spoke is one person goes and talks to everybody else. Um, and you can do that, like I said, in person and you can do it electronically by email. We, so we tell you don't do that um, you may be the smartest guy in the room, but you're not going to be able to figure out a, a, a workaround and open meeting wall because they've tried everything. So you have a question, sir? Uh, yes. What about past uh, uh, votes, past meetings, past things that have happened in the past? Is right. that is that something if that if it's not just... likely to come back before you, you could probably go ahead and talk about it. But you have to remember the context. If you're talking about uh, planning commission and planning and zoning, and you say, you know, in the past. Uh, the commission, you know, agreed to this, and this was a condition that we that they imposed or we imposed when I was on it. Um, that the risk is is that you're going to say, you know, and so for this thing coming up, okay. you know, we should do the same thing. And all of a sudden, now you've you're talking about a future item. So it's one thing just to kind of reminisce. Hey, remember that time? You know, we were. That's okay. It's still kind of risky though because it's too easy for people to kind of segue into past action into potential future, a future uh, uh, agenda item. So that, so that, so, you know, it, it's very sort of case by case in that, in that instance, just be very careful when you do this. Thank you. Uh, again, two way communication is two people talking, two people emailing back and forth. Uh, so you can't discuss, deliberate, certainly can't agree, meaning take legal action um, amongst yourselves. And like I so said, we play it very conservatively. Even if it's one-on-one, -on -one, the risk is, is that each of those one is going to go talk to one more, and then you have four people talking on a, on a seven-person board. Um, and it's a matter that can foreseeably come before you, potentially. So it doesn't have to be something specific um, that you already know is agendized. It could be something that might be agendized. So I use this example. If you're on the PSPRS board and um, you, you talk to one of your fellow board members about um, we really need to um, put more, uh, we need to put more traffic lights in town or we need to uh, save the Dells or whatever. You know, the likelihood it's that those items aren't going to come before that PS Bureau sport, let's face it. Um, so you could probably talk about those things because it's not something reasonably foreseeable. But if you're on the, uh, if you're on the planning commission and you say to someone, you know, I think that we should, always demand that every new development has private streets. You're talking about something that a topic, it's not really, it's not a specific agenda item, it's a topic that says um, that may, you may have to address in the future. Now all of a sudden you sort of committed to another person how you're going to vote or how you're going to decide or what you, so you've had this discussion and you run the risk that, you know, it just, it, it mushrooms away from there. So that's why you got to be really careful about that. And by the way, the reason for this training is not for you to know the answers, it's to know the questions. So if something comes up where you go, ah, I remember him talking about that, pick up the phone and call us or ask your staff liaison to call us and we'll get you the answer. It's not intended for you to figure it out necessarily. It's for you, it, the whole idea is to kind of spot the issue. Like this might be an open meeting issue. Should I call someone? And, and err on the side of caution, definitely call. Talk to your staff person, talk to, talk to us directly and we'll help you out. So this is what the Attorney General says. Um, the safest course of action is to assume the open meeting law applies whenever a majority of the body discusses the business of the public body. So you gotta remember sort of what your 
you know, if you're on a, on a particular board or commission, what's the business of that board or commission? Um, and is what I'm talking about kind of related to what we do? Not directly necessarily, but enough, close enough. And this talks about a majority, but we, again, very careful about, you can, you can create a majority, even though four people aren't in the same room, um, talking about it all at once. So a one-way communication is, usually it happens in an email. And what happens is, is board member A says, I need to talk to B about something. Hey, what do you think of this? Here's my idea. Would you agree with me? And B goes, not responding. So A then goes, hey C, what do you think of this? Do you like this idea? I think we should add this to the proposal. And C doesn't respond. Then A goes to D and says the exact same email. They've had a meeting, even though B and C and D don't realize that A, the emailer, has had, a, has had a consecutive series of communications and has communicated the same or similar message to, to a quorum of the, of the board. So that's, a, that's so even, you get, even if you get no response on the email, it's still considered a, a one-way communication. And so you shouldn't be proposing or discussing or deliberating things, again, outside of the meeting. Um, this is what the Attorney General says. Even if no member of the public body responds to electronic communication. So it doesn't have to be a group email to six other people, it can be one at a time. And some people will do that thinking, well, I'm only doing one at a time, and nobody responded, and therefore it's not, an open, it's not a meeting. When in reality, the Attorney General says it is, and you may disagree with the Attorney General, but that's the, that's the body, that's the agency that's going to enforce the law against you or against us. So we try and avoid that. Okay. So, what does proposed legal action mean? Um, you say Councilman Smith was admitted to the hospital last night and you blasted out, or you know, board member Smith was admitted to the hospital last night and you blasted out to your fellow board members. Probably not a, a, a topic, not, not a meeting, not a proposing action, not a discussion, deliberation. If you go, and I'll kind of change it, hey, Council Member Smith is in the hospital, he got, he got hit in a crosswalk. Probably again, not a meeting not a proposal, not a discussion. But if your commissioner board has something to do with crosswalks or stoplights, and you go, Council Member Smith or Board Member Smith's in the hospital, I hit the crosswalk. You know, we really need to talk more about putting crosswalks or stoplights or whatever in the city. And that's something that your board or commission deals with. All of a sudden now you've 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 sort of evolved from in for piece of information to an actual proposal or discussion. So again, it's very kind of fact specific, but you got to be careful about that. Um, if you're, you know, if you're sending in, hey, this is a great recipe I have, unless the city forms a cookie committee of some sort, which, you know, we form so many committees, it wouldn't surprise me, but, um, you know, it's probably not a proposal or a discussion, but asking somebody for their vote or their support on an item, you know, we're not Congress, you know, we're not the state legislature, they go and do that all the time. In the halls of Congress, in the halls of the state legislature, they work deals. Vote for my bill, I'll vote for your bill. Can't do that uh, under open meeting law. Um, and just let me tell you this, that open meeting law is a creature of state statute. It's created by the state legislature. Well, guess who the state legislature exempted from open meeting law? For themselves, right? So, um, so, so but, that, but that's the reality is, 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 is you can't go and kind of cut deals with other members of your board or commission out, you know, outside of, uh, of, the, of the meeting. You know, if you want to cut a deal up here while you're sitting here or in your meeting, um, if you like item A on the agenda and somebody else likes item B, I mean, it, it seems a little dodgy, but you can offer up your vote for A if they vote for B. If they're, you know, I would recommend against that because it doesn't look right, but it's not illegal necessarily. Okay, here's, a, here's one that's more common than not is I've got information on, a, on an item uh, or similar uh, that, that might help people decide on an item we're meeting on tomorrow. You send it to your staff person and you say, hey, please share this with everybody. Um, that's fine, staff person shares it. But if you, say, if you say in an email, please share that with everybody, this is a great idea, we should do this, then, then you're running into a problem because you're proposing an action, you're proposing an outcome and, you, and we can't, we don't want you to do that outside of the meeting. Um, again, the difference between we should put something on an agenda or 
<clears throat> we should put something on the agenda and this should be the outcome of the item. Again, see the difference, it's, it's, it's a fairly simple idea, but there's a big difference in terms of whether it's a meeting or not a meeting or a proposal or not a proposal. Uh, we talked about serial communications, you know, going from one person to the next. Again, more likely than not nowadays, it's done by email and not in person, although we've seen it happen in person as well. Um, like I said before, what you can't do in person, you can't do on the phone, you can't do by way of a memo or a letter, you can't do by way of email. You, you know, if you, can't do it, if you can't do it in person, you can't do it in, any, in a different uh, electronic way or circumstantial <laughs> type way. Again, don't use email. Um, we used to give our board of commission members prescott-az.gov email addresses, but it became kind of a nightmare for our IT, our, our IT people. So now you're using your own personal email, your Gmail accounts, generally speaking. Um, just because you use your personal email, if you, you still can't communicate with your, your fellow uh, board members just because it's your private email. It's still, A, it's probably a public record, or it, it is a public record, we'll get to that a little bit, and B, you're still having a potential meeting. Uh, so you don't wanna you don't want to do that. Don't reply all basically when you get an email. Yes, sir. Um, one of my fellow board members or you know, committee members is also a student. We're both students. Mm -hmm. I could email him about student things. It, it, right. It, it, yeah, you could email your fellow board members on items that aren't, aren't related to your your job your board function. Uh, I know, and I know a lot of people are on multiple board, you know, more than one board or commission, um, and you know, and so, you, but you got, so you have to kind of make sure that what you talk about with other people, as long as it's not related to what your board or commission does, uh, then certainly you can, you, just like you could talk to the person about it, you could talk to them on an email about it. Um, when you, the, the the downside or upside, depending how you look at it, of using email is that we have a record of it. Or, or at least there's a record out there that's retained. So if you're going to use if you're going to use your Gmail or your private email account to communicate communicate about city business, I'm going to ask you please always copy your staff liaison on it because then you don't have to worry about retaining that document because it's retained in the city server uh, in our system because as long as it goes to at least one uh, prescottaz.gov email address, then we can retain it. You don't have to save it. You don't have to worry about retention schedule. It's a little bit of a public record slash, you know, open meeting. But, but if it's just something just strictly about class. Yeah, yeah. If it's unrelated about, if it's unrelated to, to your board, then sure, not a problem. Um, so we talked enough about email, I think. Uh, no difference between, I'm gonna offer up facts or opinions um, to my fellow board members. Uh, again, if you have a set of facts, F-A-C-T-S, facts you want to share with your board members, make sure you run it through your staff person and not go directly. Um, we try to tell our staff people, by the way, if you're going to email your board or commission members, put them in the BCC line, the blind carbon copy line. That way you can't reply at all. You know, they can only reply to the sender. If you put everybody in the two line, for some reason it's too easy for people to reply at all. Um, and sometimes you get the, you, know, you see big capital letters, do not reply at all. And then somebody responds, got it, reply all. You know, go figure. Um, but it happens. Okay, so again, staff can send email. Probably for the most part, most of your staff, your, your meeting packets are now sent electronically. Um, you can certainly get those by email. Please don't reply all. Even if you have a question, like, hey, I have a question, you know, I'm looking, read my packet, and on item 7A, um, I have a question. What, you know, what's, what, what, and you ask the question. Send that only to your staff liaison. And then your staff liaison will send out, there was a question on 7A, here's the question, and here, either A, here's the response, or we'll certainly address that at the, at the meeting. But if you send it to all of your fellow board members, then what ends up happening is that somebody might try and answer, somebody might give an opinion, and it's just too easy all of a sudden for, you know, rockets to start landing back and forth and avoiding. So you want to avoid that because then you're all, all of a sudden you're having a meeting. And a meeting doesn't have to be intentional. In fact, oftentimes on email, it's not an intentional act. It's an unintentional, but it's still a meeting. And it still has a viable the meeting law violations potential. Like I said, staff can't, you can't use your staff to sort of avoid 
uh, or circumvent open media. Okay, internet and social networking, your social media accounts, the law sort of hasn't caught up with it quite yet when it comes to open meeting. Um, I would just be really careful about sort of telegraphing on like your Facebook page or whatever you're using if you use social media um, about things that, are, that, are, that your board or commission deals with. Uh, can't wait till tomorrow, I'm gonna vote no on that item. Um, or hey, my friends uh, on Facebook, uh, I got this item coming up. What do you think of this? You know, try to avoid doing that on your social media because even though it's kind of sort of open to the public, it's, it's still a closed universe. Um, so try to avoid, again, use your social media stuff, your own personal stuff, not, not, uh, not, not your board business is the, is the best advice I can give you. Um, so, because it could be construed as if you have a quorum of uh, if, if three other people or your Facebook friends are, for instance, and you start, you could have a discussion on Facebook um, on a meeting, on a meeting, on an agenda. Item. So, you got to just be careful about that. Um, it's basically considered a virtual meeting if you do. Uh, like I talked about before, you can't use your staff to help you violate open meeting law. Um, so, a couple of uh, a couple of meeting etiquette points, a little bit of the meeting law, just a little bit more advice. Um, if you have your cell phone at the meeting, put it away because what you end up seeing is people doing this, you know, when they're sitting up here or sitting whatever, wherever you're meeting. And if the public's there, the public's seeing this, you know, somebody's sitting there typing away. So what's happening? People can't multitask. People can't multitask when it comes to complex issues like texting and listening, texting and driving. We don't, we don't let you do that. So what ha what's happening is as you're texting away or messaging away or something, and you're not paying attention to your, your fellow board members that may be talking, you're not paying attention to the staff that's giving your presentation, or worse, you're not paying attention to the member of the public who's up here taking his two or three minutes to tell you what he thinks or what she thinks. So you kind of got to put your phone away. What gets kind of worse is, is when you have board member A over here doing this and board member G over here doing this, and then the public's out there going, what are those two talking about? Because their perception is, is they're communicating with each other. They're talking to each other, and the public isn't, isn't privy to what they're talking about. Now, maybe an A is going, I need to get milk, I need to get a bottle of wine, I need to, and G is going, hey, I'm gonna be home late, this meeting's going so long, the chairman doesn't know how to run a meeting, I wish he would just cut these people off. So it could be unrelated communications, but the public perception is that they're communicating with each other. So that's, you know, that's a problem that, that the, percept, the public perception is, is they're not paying attention or they're communicating outside of earshot. It's kind of like doing this and whispering to the, to the board member next to you. If you can't say it publicly, then, then you know, try not to say it um, generally because the public's going to want to know what, especially if you do it a lot, the public's going to want to know what, what are you talking about up there? Uh, because A, again, you're not paying attention, and B, you might be having a discussion that the rest of the public or the rest of the board should hear. Um, and the other thing that we found recently was that if you have somebody up there on their phone, even if they're the only person looking down their phone, I've had people go, who's, who's, who's that person communicating with? Are, is somebody telling them, feeding them information? Is somebody providing comments to somebody who, who is that person that's communicating with, with the board member who's on, who's on their phone? And so, and, and if, why can't whoever's talking to him or her come up in public and say the same thing? What's the secret? And again, we're trying to do things in public, trying to do things in the light of day. And so the problem is, is we, we, we tend to um, build more distrust by the public if we, if we do those things. So, but I, I get it, you know, sometimes you got to have your phone there because you're expecting, you know, you know, just in case, or I might have to leave early or something might come up. It's fine, but, but even if you have it there, put it aside, try not to use it as best you can. Um, or if you have to use it, maybe, you know, excuse yourself and go out and, and take the call or whatever. So just be careful about that. Um, and then the other thing I would just give you a warning about is, is before the meeting, and after the meeting, try to avoid having a discussion amongst yourselves, particularly if it's a quorum of you, three or four, even if it's close, three or four people talking, because 
for a couple, again, a couple things. You might be having a discussion about the topic, um, and that should be done at a meeting. And the other thing, what we've learned recently, particularly with Zoom, is the concept of the hot mic. And that's not some guy staff member. That is a live mic that's on, and we don't really realize it's on, and all of a sudden, your conversation is being picked up and broadcast before the meeting. And so you just gotta be careful about having those discussions, especially now, since we're doing these virtual Zoom broadcasts. You know, they, they turn the mic on early just to make sure everything's working. Um, and so oftentimes before the meeting, it'll pick up a conversation. Uh, and we wanna make sure that the public isn't hearing a pre-discussion of an item, for instance, or after the meeting, same way. Okay, social events. Uh, we have this thing here in Prescott called the Courtesy Agenda. So, for instance, this morning we had a planning commission meeting. Uh, we we have we have a standing courtesy agenda that there might be a quorum of the city council attending. Obviously, this morning there clearly was in the room, and maybe maybe by way of Zoom there were more than four. Um, so we post the courtesy agenda, saying, "Hey, there might be there might be a, quor a quorum, might be a majority of the board or commission or the council at the meeting." All that does is let the public know there might be a majority. What it doesn't allow that majority to do is say anything particularly when there's, a, when there's a majority there, because we don't want is um, a, a, a one council member to say something when there's three others around, because then they're having a meeting and we haven't agendized that meeting. Um, yes, sir. Even if it's a question? Yeah, we try and avoid that because the question is, is part of the discussion and deliberation. So um, we try and avoid that, particularly when there is a, a majority around. And this morning, I'll give you an example of the planning commission. Uh, There's clearly a majority of the council here, and it was indicated that there might be a majority of the airport advisory commission here. So we told, I told them both, you know, if there's a majority, nobody can say anything at this point because we don't want it to be, because the airport, you know, in that particular instance, when you're talking about the AED Save the Dallas deal, the airport advisory committee may, may come before them for advice or, or a look. So it's, it was close enough where we wanted to play it safe and make sure that they didn't in, indirectly or unintentionally have a meeting. So we, we did that. Um, another thing that you're certainly, where we, where we post these courtesy agendas is when there are public speeches, when there are sort of public forums, political forums, whatever, we oftentimes will post a courtesy agenda that there's gonna be, there may be a majority of this board, this commission, this council at this event. If you think there might be a majority then make sure your staff, you know, your staff person knows that and they can take and help post that. Um, you know, like the mayor gives a state of the city once a year. Oftentimes there's there's quorums, various quora of, of different boards and commissions. We try and post those. If you do go to those, um, try not to gaggle as a group uh, where you have a quorum, you have a, you know, you're all sitting at the same table, kind of maybe spread out a little bit if you can, um, just so it, the temptation doesn't, that, you know, isn't there to have a discussion about city business because again, just because we agendize it as a courtesy doesn't mean you can sit there and talk about about the board or city business. Uh, media communications, um, you may get depending on your board of commission, a reporter, the newspaper, or radio station to come up to you um, or call you and say, "Hey, would you make a comment? You're on, you're going to be talking about this at your meeting tomorrow. Would you have a comment for me?" You are allowed to do that. That's the one sort of exception to the open meeting law where you may communicate with the majority of your board by way of the, the, the media. Um, it, it's sort of a first amendment outweighs open meeting law kind of concept. Um, so even though technically you're allowed to do that as, as a matter of law, my advice is don't do that before the meeting um, for a couple of reasons. One is you can give this beautiful response, beautiful answer, and, and the reporter sits there and cuts it down to one sentence or out of 30 seconds recorded on the radio station, you get seven seconds. It's out of context. It may not say everything you want to say. So you have to be kind of careful because, the, again, it goes to the public perception. If you say, love this project, going to vote for it, um, can't wait to vote, then the public is going to be like, well, why are we even having the meeting then? This guy's already committed is to, 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 to vote for it. You may think that. But you still want to you want to at least give the perception you're going to listen to staff you're going to listen to your fellow board members you're going to listen to what the public has to say and then you vote you and you may have, you may not change your opinion throughout the whole thing but at least give it a fair hearing i guess is the is the is the advice 
you know, after the meeting, when, you, when you're done voting, again, you may get the reporter come up to you, why'd you vote no? Everybody else voted yes, you voted no, tell me why. My advice is, if you're gonna, you can, if you feel it necessary to explain your vote, explain it before you vote. You know, when, when there's a, a motion in the second, you don't always have, or before there's a motion, you can always ask, the, you know, hey, Mr. Chairman, Madam Chairman, I'd like to explain how I'm gonna vote. After, every, after everything's been discussed, you've heard from the public, heard from staff, heard from your fellow board members, I'd like to explain my vote before I vote. And you certainly are absolutely entitled to do that, um, you know, before, before, you know, before you vote. So that's the best way to do it again, because um, this is sort of the attorney general opinion. You are allowed to talk to the media. Again, you gotta be kind of smart when you do it, because if you look at the, you know, misquotes, quotes taken out of context, um, I love the Abraham Lincoln quote, it's one of the best. Don't believe everything you see on the internet just because there's a picture and a quote, Abraham Lincoln, right? Abraham Lincoln wasn't around here. Uh, but just as a, so just to avoid making this political, this gaffe picture has been up there for about six years. So it had nothing to do with the current presidential race. All right, so what's the public right? Just, and this is really for people who are, you know, chair people of a commission or if you're running the meeting. Public has the right to attend, it's an open meeting hall, unless it's an exec session. Public can listen, they can record either audio and or video. And as long as they don't, as long as their equipment doesn't interfere with your meeting or interfere with the public's being able to see the meeting, it's perfectly fine for them to bring, you know, recording equipment in. Um, and we try and make sure that we don't block, you know, the view of the, of the board members talking. Um, and we've learned this really from experience and recently is there are a lot of people who have, you know, as you get older, your hearing kind of goes. And so it helps be able to see, not only hear the person, but see their lips move. And that helps people who are kind of hearing impaired to, to really hear what, what's being said. So if there's a bunch of equipment in front and you can't see the people talking, it's harder for some people to, uh, to uh, you know, to really hear or understand what's being said. So in, this, in the same regard, when you're talking, you know, they want you to talk into the microphone, lean in so it goes over to the Zoom. Um, sometimes people will turn and talk to their fellow board members, but if you can try to talk towards the public, then the people in the audience are, can better see you. And certainly, we see this a lot too, where people will go, you know, on the board, and they'll start talking away from the mic and away from the public. And I don't know, I mean, my hearing has gotten worse over the years, and I have a hard time hearing if somebody turns their back to me and talks, I have a hard, sometimes I have a hard time understanding, and it's in particular with female voices. So, I'm just kidding. Uh, but seriously, you, you know, try and talk into the mic uh, if, if you are recorded or broadcasting on Zoom, um, and try and talk sort of towards the audience as best you can. Just kind of remember those tricks, so that way everybody can kind of participate. That's called selective hearing. Mm -hmm. <laughs> What was that? <laughs> so, but here's the thing. The public doesn't have the right to speak at a meeting. Sounds kind of counterintuitive, unless it's a public hearing. So a, a, you have open meeting, all of our meetings are open, except exec sessions. And under open meetings, there's a subset called a public hearing. And public hearings happen when the law says you have to have a public hearing. Rezoning decisions are public hearings. Um, tax votes or public hearings, budgets or public hearings. So certain things have to have a public hearing, liquor license applications have to have a public hearing. Those are when the public has the right to speak as a matter of law. Now, as a chairperson, you can certainly open the floor to comments on non-public hearing items, but that's your discretion. The public doesn't always have a right to speak on things. And so you'll see, for instance, council study sessions where the council um, is going to just talk amongst or get a presentation from staff, have a little bit of discussion amongst itself, and then an item will probably come back before the council on one or more occasions. And if, if, the, if the council or the mayor just wants to have the presentation uh, and or a training or something like that, then we probably won't let the public comment on it because more than likely the item will come back before the council, at which point the public will have the opportunity to be heard. So, Bottom line, at the end of open meeting to training, when in doubt, do everything in the open. Do everything at your meeting, err on the side of openness. And if you have any questions about open meeting issues, call us or use your staff person to call us. We'll certainly address your questions quickly before, you know, usually before the meeting. Yes, sir. 
I'm going to have a hard time asking this question, but I'm going to try nonetheless. We talked about a, a board or commission member in open meetings, meaning you can't talk to, talk amongst yourselves unless you're public. You can't come out. You can't follow. You can't meet. What about the public uh, corralling a board member or a commissioner to act in a certain way? You mean outside of the meeting? Yeah, let's say before, let's say meetings come up on uh, mm -hmm. Monday. Right. And Thursday before, a bunch of people who have an agenda in the meeting. Now, in our, at, at our meetings, the public can talk. Right. They, they can voice their opinion like we did today. Uh, but is there any discussion or consideration about if a public tries to influence a council, board, right. commissioner? Okay. Right. So, question is, is can the outside of the meeting, before meeting, can the public approach you and try and talk to you about an upcoming agenda item? And, and the answer is, is, yeah, they can try. And a similar question came up yesterday. So what happens oftentimes, not so much here, but you know, you see other places where, particularly in like the development world, what happens is, is developers or their lawyers will sit there and lobby all the planning commissioners or all of the, all of the council members, or they'll try and meet with them one-on-one -on -one to tell those folks why they should vote yes on my project, why my project's so good, or what do you think about my project? Do you like my project? Is there things I can do to help get your vote? Now, so, so the answer to that is, is you aren't obligated to talk to either the applicant or a member of the public on an item. You can tell them, you know what, I'm going to wait to hear at the meeting. And I don't, I don't want to talk to you. So you, don't, you aren't obligated to talk to those folks. And you do it in a, you know, in a polite way. You know, hey, I'm going to wait till the meeting so I can hear everything all at once. Thanks. I appreciate you're interested in this issue, but I'm just going to wait till the meeting and, and I, I really don't want to talk to you about it at this point. That's fine. If you do decide to talk to someone, whether it's an applicant or a member of the public, whether they're for or against something that's coming up, you can certainly listen to them um, and not respond. Um, you can ask them questions, but I wouldn't get into a big debate about it because again, you know, even with the applicant, for instance, you don't, you want to make sure that, that um, they're, you know, they're, you're hearing the, the whole picture and not just pieces and parts all at once. So then you can make kind of a thorough, you can have a thorough analysis and a fully informed decision when, once you hear it all, all at once from everybody involved. What I would also recommend though, is if you do have an applicant come to you who has an item on an agenda coming up, that you make sure you make clear to them, I'll meet with you, but, and I know you're meeting with the other board members, but please do not tell me what you told other board members. I just want you to talk to me about whatever you want to talk to me about. Don't tell me what you told other board members and certainly don't tell me what they said to you. And if they do that, you kind of have to check them and say, okay, stop. You can't tell me this stuff. Uh, now, if that, if that happens where you meet with a, 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 um, an applicant of some sort, you can also tell them, look, I'll meet with you, but here's the condition. I'm going to announce that I met with you last Wednesday in advance of this meeting and, and I had this meeting with, with, with this person and I just want the public to know for the record that I had a meeting and, and we talked about the project, but I, but I didn't say anything. I didn't commit one way or the other. I mean, so you can go ahead and publicly disclose that you're not obligated to, but it's not a bad practice. So if somebody, an applicant, a member of the public approaches you to talk about something, sort of the best course of action is to say, hey, you know what? I'm gonna wait till the meeting. You know, I'm a, I'm a volunteer. I spent a lot of time studying the packet. I spent a lot of time at the meeting. What I don't want to do is spend a lot of time on my Sunday talking to you about this when you can talk to me on Tuesday with the rest of the commission. That's, you know, or, or, or board or, or, you know, or group. That's kind of the best answer. Uh, it's just to kind of just say politely, hey, sorry now. Yes, ma'am. How come they can daisy chain? Who's the, they? The developer or well, it, it, again, they have the right to ask for a meeting with a, a commission member or a council member. Council members are not obligated to do that, to meet. Um, and they're avoiding, that's why I say you've got to avoid the day's change because if the, if the applicant comes in and says, I'm going to make a presentation to you ahead of time, and that's what they do, and then they do 
They don't talk about what they talked about with other commission members or council members. And then they have the same presentation seven times, kind of a preview. It's not tactically daisy chaining because they aren't communicating. They're, communic they're not a member of the board or commission is the, is, is the bottom line. Is they're an applicant, so they can't ask to meet, meet with you. Now, I'll give you some bad examples. Um, the city down in, in the valley was meeting with a sports team, and they went to the, the – so in order to avoid open meeting law, the sports team invited two members of the council, and then three members of the council, and then two members of the council back-to-back-to-back -to -back -to -back meetings with the media there. Like the TV stations filming as people were coming and going. So even though tactically it wasn't an open meeting law violation, um, nobody knew nobody knows what happened inside the room or inside the building where they were meeting. It just looks really bad. So again, an applicant can ask you to meet, and they may meet, they may ask the other board or commission members or the council members to meet. You don't have to meet, and you just have to be very careful about what they tell you. If they start telling you what they told other people or what they um, what other people said, the other board member said, then you got to stop them. But it's, it is different because an applicant, is, you know, a, a board member can't do that with six other people, but an applicant can, it's just the difference in how it works. Uh, so, but you got to at the same time, you have to be careful. So any other questions about what the meeting law that were online or anything? No. no? Okay. We're going to go. John? No, I, I just yes, sir. And, and excuse me if you've answered this, because I just didn't catch it, but a commission member and a city council person. Is that, how, how does that fall? If you're, talking um, if, if you're on a board or commission and you're going to talk to a, a council member uh, about an item that's coming up, it's probably not an open meeting law issue because you're not, you're, you're, you're on different bodies. Mm -hmm. um, at the same time, it's, if, if you're on a board or commission that's making a recommendation to the city council, so for instance, we have the Board of Adjustment. Board of Adjustment makes a decision, and the next step, if they don't like it, if somebody doesn't like it, you go to court. So they're not, so it's, um, or PSPRS, they're making a decision. If somebody doesn't like the decision, you go to court. Um, versus Planning Commission or uh, Airport Advisory, for instance, they're making recommendations, you're making recommendations to the council. So it's not advisable to have conversations with with council members, the, the people you're making recommendations to, particularly if that council member is going, you know, I want you to vote this way. Because then they're kind of saying, I want you to give me the recommendation I want. And you're supposed to be an independent review of the item. The council can accept your recommendation, they can completely reject it, or they can accept it with a few tweaks or changes. So it's really not advisable. And I try and tell the council members, don't tell your advisory boards and commissions the answer you want. Let them come up with an answer. If you don't like it, then do something different. But don't try and sort of, you know, um, that's the word I'm thinking of. You know, cheat the system. Let, 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 the, let the system work. Let the advisory commission, committee board do its work. Vote on it. And then you have this recommendation. And it is what it is. If you don't like it, disagree with it as, as a council member. So particularly before the, you know, before the vote occurs. It's a little different if you're on an advisory board and you vote on something and a council member comes to you and says, hey, you said something or you voted this way and I just want to know, didn't quite understand why you voted the way you did. A little bit more explanation. That's, that's okay because they're looking for information. But when they talk to you before you vote and they try and kind of convince you or suggest to you how you should vote, it's kind of inappropriate because you're kind of defeating the purpose of, a, of an objective advisory board uh, and what, what their goal is. So, can you answer your question? Yes, sir. Thank you. Yes, Does that happen often? Uh -huh. Yeah. Not often. It happens every once in a while. We try and try to advise people not to do that because, again, you know, it, it don't, don't, if I'm going to you for advice or you're coming to me for advice, don't tell me the advice you want. What, what good does it do? You know, I, if you want me to give you a, a, a well thought out, objective advice on something, ask me the question and I'll tell you what I think. You know, after I look into it. But don't tell me, I want your advice and here's the answer I want. What's the point? Right. And, that, and that's, you know, in its simplest form, that's, that's kind of the challenge. Um, public records law, really quickly, going to jam through this, is 
whatever the city <laughs> creates in its normal course of business is a public record. So documents, emails, videos like this, audio recordings, police reports, building permits, all that stuff that we, we create or consider public records and generally are gonna be accessible to the public with some exceptions if we redact out, you know, maybe some medical records would be redacted. Certainly attorney-client privilege documents are gonna be, are gonna not be shared. Um, so in your instance, you're gonna, if you do an email about city business, it's probably a public record. Um, so that's why I suggest that you're, you send it to at least or include one of your staff people on it so that it's, it's preserved in our, in our email system. At the same time, if you're taking notes during the meeting about what someone said or what your thoughts are um, or what you want to say at, when it comes to your turn, most likely all that gets documented in the minutes so you don't have to keep those notes. Um, if you ahead of time pre-prepare some questions as you're going through you know, your staff report um, and then you ask those questions during the meeting, all that stuff's in the minutes. You probably don't have to keep that, that handwritten or those notes. Um, you can always ask your board clerk, hey, here are my notes. Here, you want to keep these? I don't want them. I don't need them. Um, but so generally speaking, you're most likely you're going to create a public record as, you, as your emails. Um, if you get your staff packet, uh, whether it's electronic or whether it's a piece of a stack of paper, you don't have to keep that as a public record. Go ahead and recycle it because there's one original of that, and that's the public record that we have to maintain. So. Um, if you have any questions about sort of public records and what do I do with it, ask your staff person, your board clerk, or ask us. We can help you sort of dispose of it and not get into a, I destroyed a public record. If you have the only original of a document that you think is a public record, you gotta give that to someone so that it's retained properly. Um, but if, so if you have a question about that, definitely check with your staff people and they'll be able to work with us and we'll get you the answer. So any questions on public records? Okay, gonna go to, Conflicts of interest. Real quick. Okay, so there's two kinds of conflicts of interest. One is don't take bribes, don't take favors, don't, you know, hey, if you vote for this, I'll give you cardinal season tickets, or probably worthless now, but um, I'll give you, you know, whatever, I'll give you something. I mean, that's a simple answer. Okay, that's the simple sort of don't do that conflicts law. Um, the other conflicts law is when, when something's coming before you, even if you're a recommending body, you're not making the final decision, and you have an interest in that, or you benefit, or either you benefit from it, or it hurts you financially or, your, or from a business standpoint. So if you're, if you're gonna vote on something, even if it's a recommendation, um, that somehow you might financially benefit from, you probably have a conflict of interest. So the thing to know in, in this training is if you think you might have a conflict of interest, get a hold of us or through, either through your staff person or directly, and we'll walk you through, we'll, we'll hear what you have to tell us, and we'll give you an opinion. Yeah, you have a conflict, and no, you don't. Um, or, hey, my business might benefit from this. Should I, should I recuse myself? There's nothing wrong with having a conflict of interest. The problems arise when you don't disclose it and you don't recuse yourself. Um, so let's say, for instance, you're making some sort of land use decision or you're on the Parks and Recreation Commission and you're recommending that a park get built uh, in your neighborhood, for instance, or your land use decision is going to be near your neighborhood and affect you. But if it affects everybody in the neighborhood pretty much equally, you probably don't have a conflict because it's sort of it, the benefits or the detriments are pretty much spread out amongst a big group of people. If your property is right next to something that's, that you're going to vote on and you think that your property value is going to go up or down, you might have a conflict, so you need to come see us because then we'll walk through the analysis. Um, I don't know if anybody remembers or if anybody watched the, the uh, city council meeting on Tuesday on the Banner Help SUP to go to 71 feet or 75 feet. If we had two recusals. We had the mayor who recused himself. And he had a conflict of interest because his explanation was, my wife is a real estate agent who, who benefits from the sale of property in this, in this project. So he's recused himself all along from the very beginning. He, what, he's, he's not involved himself in any discussions or decisions on that property, that Whispering Rock property out near Ember Hill because his wife had a, had a business interest or financial interest in the outcome. 
So he recused himself. So it's you or a family member uh, that has an interest in it. So he recused himself. Again, perfectly the, the, the exact right thing to do. Um, just because you have a conflict doesn't mean it's bad, doesn't mean you're doing anything wrong. Particularly in a smaller community, there's a lot more intermingling of business and personal interest in, in decisions that might come before you. Um, again, the problem is, is when you, when you don't disclose it and when you don't recuse yourself, that's when you get into trouble. That's kind of becomes potentially a criminal act. The other recusal was council member Shishka. And his wasn't a financial interest. His what was more of a, an appearance issue and a fiduciary problem. So Councilman Shishka says, hey, I'm on the board of directors of YRMC. So I've got a fiduciary duty to, the, to YRMC to do what is in its best interest. But I'm also on the city council, so I got a fiduciary duty to the city of Prescott and its residents. Um, I can't give this thing a fair hearing. So I'm going to recuse myself because I, I want to make sure that everything is on the level. And that again is one of those perfectly acceptable reasons to recuse yourself, announce that the conflict and recuse yourself uh, and not be involved in it. This, it's, a, it's a, you know. Now, Councilman Schuch could vote on every other item, for instance, that deals with the Whispering Rock project out there near Amber Grove. But this one, because it had to dealt with Banner Hospital, uh, he felt he had a conflict. He talked, again, one of those things where he talked to us ahead of time, us being in the legal department, we walked him through it, we analyzed it, and we gave him advice, and he followed the advice, which is, yeah, go ahead and recuse yourself, it's because it's, it, if nothing else, it's gonna look bad. It's an appearance of impropriety. And again, we're trying to make sure that the public perception is everything is done on the level. Um, so, one last but not least, on conflicts of interest, you may have a philosophical objection to something or a political view that supports whatever something comes up on this, I'm always gonna vote for it. I don't care what anybody says. I'm committed to whatever. That's not a conflict of interest because it's not a, it's a deeply held belief, but it's not a financial or business interest in that item. So you may, you may always vote against um, multifamily housing, you're on planning commission. I don't like multifamily housing, hate it. I'm always gonna vote against it, not a conflict. Um, in and of itself, because it's just, you know, maybe irrational, <laughs> but, but, you know, I don't, I, I'm, I'm going to always vote against it, so, but not, not a conflict of interest in and of itself. So the point about conflicts is, if you, you know, I want you to kind of spot the issues, if you think you might have an interest, or you might benefit from a, from a vote or a discussion you're involved in, or you might, or it might hurt you, or hurt you or a family member, um, definitely talk to us first preferably well before the meeting so we can do our do an analysis and give you give you an answer and and um, and if we tell you hey there's no conflict here's why you're entitled to rely on that um, that information as long as you tell us all the pertinent facts so any questions on conflicts of interest that's all I have for you today so um, hopefully it was somewhat entertaining and somewhat tolerable. I know some of you have been in five, four and a half, five hours of meetings today, so you're excused. Thank you.